Okay, here they come. Okay, welcome everybody as you're coming into the room. Um, you're muted and you'll stay muted until we get to the Q&A at the end. So give, give people a few seconds here to all get in and connected, but don't worry that you're muted. Don't worry that you can't hear yourself talking. Everybody's muted and only myself and uh, Dr. Zapeta can unmute you. And we'll keep it that way while he gives his presentation for the first 40 minutes or so. And then at the end, I will unmute you so you can ask a question and have a conversation with Dr. Zapeta if you have any questions. And we'll work it the same way we did last time. If you were at the last Science and Faith lecture series on Zoom, there's a little chat button at the bottom center of your screen. You click the little chat button and there'll be a chat window that comes up. At any point during the presentation, you can type in any question you have for Dr. Zapeta in the chat window, and then I'll see it. And we'll keep a running tab of all the questions so that when we get to the Q&A, we can work our way through the questions and you'll get a chance to talk with Dr. Zapeta about whatever question you may have, okay? A couple more people in here. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> okay, excellent. More and more people are coming. Um, again, I'm just going to reiterate for the people who came in a little bit late here. Everybody's muted. We'll keep you muted all through the presentation. And if you have any questions, just type it in the chat. And then at the end, you'll get a chance to talk with Dr. Zapeta. I'll introduce you so you can ask your question yourself and hear his, his reply. Uh, still some people coming in from the waiting room, so. Okay, we'll, we'll wait one more minute here, and then I'll give the official introduction, and we'll get started. Uh, yeah, some more people coming in. Okay, I think I'm gonna get started now. For the people who came in late, I'm just gonna reiterate again, if you have any question at any point during Dr. Zapeta's presentation, just type it in the chat window. In the bottom middle of your screen, your video feed, there's a chat button. If you type that, a window pops up where you can type in any question. I'll see your question, we'll save them till the end. And for the last 15, 20 minutes, you'll get a chance to chat with Dr. Zapeta one-on-one. -on -one. Until that moment, we'll keep everybody on mute. So. Zapeta can give his, Dr. Zapeta can give his, his presentation without interruption. Okay, so now I would like to introduce, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph Zapeta, 
He's an associate professor at St. Mary's College in California, and he teaches in the Integral Program of Liberal Arts. He's a graduate of Thomas Aquinas College, and then he completed his doctorate in the History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Notre Dame. His published work focuses on the relation between science and philosophical thought during the scientific revolution. So he has a couple upcoming papers ready to be published in different philosophy journals about this issue, Galileo and his relation to the church. So it's gonna be a very insightful presentation. He lives currently in the east side of the San Francisco Bay Area with his wife, Julie, and their seven children, which is amazing. Anyway, welcome Dr. Zepeda. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Brother John. Thank you, St. Dominic's. Uh, and any other guests who have joined us. Um, one point of update, it's now eight children um, <laughs> since I emailed that to you. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say before we get going, um, so I, I presume that much of the audience uh, knows you, Brother John, from the parish. Um, when I first met John Winkowich, he was a college freshman and he didn't say a word for the first semester of our discussion class. Um, until near the end of the semester, all of a sudden he exploded with this complicated diagram that he put up on the board and explained to everybody. And we all sort of sat back and thought, he's been holding that in the whole time? How, how does he do that? Um, he was always a man of few words, but made them count. And then, but I, I saw him more recently give a vocation talk for a parish and it was just, it was inspiring and beautiful and eloquent. And I thought, well, he has put in the work to go from his comfort level of quantity of public speaking when he was in college to, to where he is now in the order of preachers. I, it's a, really cool to see that. And so I'm even more than usually pleased to be giving a presentation like this since, since he's involved and you, uh, the parish that he's been at, are involved. Okay, so I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between being on screen like this and having my presentation on screen like this, um, or sometimes being sort of alongside of it like this. Um, that might be a little creepy, but I'll, I'll just do it anyway. Uh, okay, why don't we start back up here to our first page. Um, Galileo Galilei was born in 1564, died in 1642. Um, world famous for centuries as kind of a founding father of modern science. He was a polymath, an exceptionally able thinker, um, and also a great writer at the same time. Um, and, but one of the things he's most famous for is his involvement in this, in this affair, the, the sometimes called the Galileo Affair, as a, as a shorthand for a sort of complex series of events that took place between him and the church. Uh, and it's become sort of a notorious event, as I'm sure everybody's aware at some, you know, whether you've paid a lot of, of attention to it or a little bit of attention to it, everybody's heard about it. Um, and it's become in some ways a sort of stick with which people beat each other uh, to smack your opponents. So, well, what about the Galileo situation? Um, or actually you're wrong about Galileo, it's the other way around. And so uh, it becomes sort of a, a point of contention. Um, now, it's a complicated affair in some ways, um, most of those sticks that people beat each other with about this are simplifications or oversimplifications or outright myths about what happened and what it means. Um, but it's not wrong to look to it for lessons and try to figure out what, what really happened and how should we evaluate the actions of the church at that time? How should we understand them? Um, how should we understand Galileo's position? Um, does it say anything about the relationship between science and faith, between reason and revelation between um, free individual inquiry and the authoritative teaching of the church. Are there lessons to be drawn from that? Is there wisdom that can be gleaned from it? I think, it, I think the answer is yes, we should try to, to learn from it. It's not just something that happened and has no lessons for us, um, but it is complicated. So the, the purpose of this talk at the broadest level is to help point us in the direction of a thoughtful and a wise way to look for the meaning or the import or the lessons of this, to get beyond the mythology, to get beyond the, the simplifications and the, uh, the mere reactions to what my enemies say about the Galileo affair, et cetera, um, and to, to gain a deep 
Christian understanding of what happened and what it, what it can tell us. So let's jump into it. Why in the first place is this, has this been such a, a, a sort of, not only controversial at the time, but why has it continued to be discussed, debated, um, and why has it continued to be a notorious controversy to this day? Well, I like to say that it's sort of a perfect storm. Um, it involves several different intersecting uh, relationships that are each of them rather controversial or prone to controversy. Um, so let's take first and perhaps most obvious, this question of the relationship between faith and reason. Um, sometimes people break this, break down sort of possible views on this relationship as, well, they're in conflict. Um, they're two opposing and irreconcilable ways of approaching the world or what to believe, um, what to think. Um, others say, no, it's all right. They're just in separate domains. They just don't, it's just, you know, it's meaning and facts or something like that. And they just, they just don't intersect at all. And, and um, others say, no, there's a deep harmony or there's some congruence or uh, consistency between them. And of course, it's the last view that we want to hold on to, right? Because that's, the, as uh, Pope John Paul II said, um, now I'm going to forget the actual quote that I was reaching for, uh, the two wings on which the human spirit rises to the truth, I think is what he says, faith and reason. Um, so, so some people following this, this division, um, some people take the moral of the Galileo affair to be, well, the church was bad. They were irrational and they had power to enforce their irrationality. Um, Galileo stands as the kind of hero of reason and science against blind faith and authoritarianism. Um, and usually this comes from a pretty cartoonish view or it comes along with a pretty cartoonish view of the actual history. Or some people say, no, there's no overlap. They're just different things. Faith and reason are different things. This was a tragic missed opportunity. Um, maybe Galileo was wrong in this way or the church was wrong in that way, but really what they should have seen is that they really should have just been talking about different topics and never the twain shall meet. Or you have, sorry, I'm gonna, there we go. Or you have some who say, well, faith and reason are not fundamentally in conflict. And in fact, the church was in the right and Galileo was, was at fault because he was a, a jerk or he was overconfident or he was wrong about scientific methodology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these things have some piece of the truth that they're based on, but they're all kind of cartoonish or polemical ways of approaching this. And they all tend to miss out the big picture. So what I would like us to strive for instead is to see the Galileo affair as a tragic missed opportunity for the integration of faith and scientific inquiry, faith and reason um, in the perspective of wisdom, wisdom that puts things in order and sees them in relationship to the whole. And the tragic quality of this affair is that it didn't have to be this way. The, church, the church's own intellectual tradition has the resources to overcome the misunderstandings and the conflict um, that were involved in this affair. And so I hope to point some of those things out as we go along. Okay, but that's just one piece of why this is sort of a perfect storm of controversy. Um, that may be the, the main piece, but it's not the only one. Another one is that we have to recognize that the church was not just a body of believers and clergy who uh, had certain views on this question, on the relationship between scripture and science, heliocentrism and so on. Um, the church was an authority at the time. And so this, is, this fits into the complicated history of the church's relationship to civil authority um, because it wasn't just, oh, the cardinals or the Pope don't like what I'm saying, what I, Galileo, am saying. It was, um, you know, you have to, to publish a book, you have to get it cleared by the papal censor and you have to get approval to actually be allowed to, uh, to uh, promulgate and publish this thing in, in Galileo's time and place, at least. Um, so this has also become kind of a symbol that the whole affair has become kind of a symbol for the, the, uh, the freedom of, for freedom of thought and freedom of inquiry, the freedom to philosophize. And some see this as really the core of the issue. And on this view, the fundamental conflict is not so much about whether it's heliocentrism or whether it's about scripture, but really just about whether 
a political or ecclesial authority can tell individuals what they should inquire into um, and what they should uh, what they should think and speak in public. So that's one other angle that makes it controversial. Um, there's there's more. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, backing up here. The whole Copernican idea, the whole tr transition from a geocentric view of the world and the cosmos to a heliocentric um, was radical and revolutionary. And the more radical an idea or discovery is, the more likely it's going to be contradicted by a wide range of considerations initially. So it wasn't just that astronomers said, well, we don't know about this. That seems weird to put the sun in the middle. It's that the whole way of thinking about the natural world, the categories that you organized it with, the way that you thought about what's natural for a body to do, what explains the way things move or stay still, all that was intertwined with the view of the cosmos where the earth was still at the middle and the sun was moving around along with the other heavenly bodies. Um, so when Copernicus, Galileo's predecessor, who, who publishes uh, his famous work saying that actually it makes more sense to put the sun in the middle, um, and Galileo takes up this cause. So Galileo in doing so doesn't just claim that heliocentrism is a better astronomical theory. He also wants to reconfigure the interrelationships among the different sciences. And he wants to even change at least partially the idea of how you act rationally in scientific inquiry. Um, and particularly important in this affair is the relationship between philosophy and theology on the one hand and the mathematical study of nature on the other hand. So Galileo famously says in another work, um, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. If you don't speak the language, you can't read the book. So he sees that as key to all understanding of nature. And uh, so part of what's going on here is which science is more, is uh, what's the hierarchy among the sciences? Are some of them more certain than others? Are some of them more, um, do some of them sort of have more decisive power than others? Um, and Galileo kind of wants to read, you know, shake up that arrangement. Um, so it's not just about one theory, but about what makes for a good theory and what kind of objections have to be answered and which discipline has to answer to which other discipline, if at all. Okay, that got a little wordy there. But because of that, part of the history here is also the relationship, um, sorry, part of that hierarchy that I was just talking about there's this notion that theology was the queen of the sciences. And so one thing that Galileo takes up in his writings about these issues about science and scripture is, what does it mean to say that theology is the queen of the sciences? Does that mean that when I am studying astronomy or physics, a theologian who hasn't read my work can say, stop doing that. We know that's wrong because of, because of something in theology, because of something from scripture um, or the tradition of the church. Um, so Galileo wants to question that and maybe distinguish that sense of queenship in a different way. Um, so John Paul II also said this in reflecting on the Galileo affair. Part of the tragedy of it is that there was a lot of mutual misunderstanding and, and, and disagreement, of course, um, that came down to how to relate different disciplines of thought to each other. And because this idea was still so revolutionary, this really hadn't been sorted out yet. Um, I'll give another sort of example where you get sort of catch 22s in the in the development of science. Part of the part of what was weird about putting the sun at the middle and the earth going around it is then you have no idea how is it that the earth is moving around and we're not falling off of it, we don't feel it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well, you don't get the physics to explain that until Isaac Newton, basically, but you can't have Newton's theory of universal gravitation without having Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and you can't have those without having Copernicus and going heliocentric first. So in order to figure out the physics that would explain the Copernican model, you first have to accept the Copernican model. So it becomes a little bit of a, uh, I don't know how to put it. Yeah, a catch-22, I guess, it says, it says it well enough. Um, so there, there are questions when a revolutionary idea comes up in science. There are very reasonable questions where you may not have the resources to answer them yet. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so in looking at this affair then, 
there are some distinctions that I think we need to keep in mind. Um, these are just some of them. One is that in evaluating, okay, who was reasonable, who was right, who was on, who was on the side of goodness and light and who was confusing things or being, being wicked or should be judged to have made a mistake in this set of events, we have to distinguish being right from being reasonable. Now, anybody who's married knows that these are not the same thing. Um, also, anybody who's a child or a parent. So pretty much everybody knows, if you think about it in your own life, if somebody's right, it doesn't mean they're being reasonable about it. They may be right for the wrong reason. Um, so just cherry picking, and in particular, what some people do with this affair is they go back to, uh, let me jump onto the screen here for a little bit so I can talk more intelligibly. They go back to some part of the Galileo affair and say, aha, see what Galileo say, says here, he was wrong about that. So end of story, church is right, I wash my hands. Okay, well, Galileo was wrong about some things, um, but in the church being right on that particular point, were they right just sort of accidentally as an accident of history, or was it because the church had a reasonable approach to the relationship between scripture, church authority, and investigating nature? So those are two different questions. So it won't do, it's not sufficient for an understanding of this to just go back and say, at this moment, who was closest to being right as judged by contemporary science now? That way of looking at it won't really give us an understanding of what was happening. Second, it's important to acknowledge, frankly, the imperfections and the outright vice that can exist in the church and its leaders. And, and we shouldn't go into and trying to understand this with the assumption that um, because in principle, the church can harmonize faith and reason. That means that particular historical actors were doing a good job of it at any given time. Um, we know all too well that that's not the same thing. Um, something is, so the church is in principle a protector of children, but we all know that that doesn't mean that certain people didn't go the other way in recent in recent times. So this is just to say the people involved in this are human beings, and we need to keep that in mind. Third is maybe a little obvious, avoid gotcha solutions. If you find one piece of, the, of this picture or one passage in Galileo's writings or one passage in St. Robert Bellarmine's writings, as we'll get to, um, and you say, aha, that's right, or that's wrong, or this guy contradicted himself, um, end of story, don't need to understand anymore. That may work for getting somebody in a polemical argument, but it doesn't necessarily help us understand. Fourth, often there's a lot of blame to go around. So just because Galileo was kind of a jerk about something, or maybe he was overconfident about this aspect of his theory or that aspect, um, that doesn't answer all the questions about how was the church um, fulfilling its role as the custodianship of the custodian of the faith and the authoritative teaching of the faith, along with a proper openness to the development of natural inquiry. Okay, fifth, to distinguish a necessary condition from a full explanation. Um, that needs a little bit of explanation, I think. What I mean here is it's important not to just look back and say, well, this whole thing could have been avoided if Galileo had been more diplomatic at this moment. That may actually be true. And it's important to notice that because that helps us see that this wasn't inevitable. Um, I think that's, that is an important lesson here. This wasn't an inevitable outcome. Um, some people do think that it was more or less inevitable that if it hadn't been Galileo, it would have been somebody else. If it hadn't been in this year, it would have been a few years later, et cetera. I think that's not so clear. Um, so it is important to note these, these contingencies that something small could have been otherwise and the whole thing could have just turned out very differently. Um, but just pointing out that small thing is, again, not a full explanation or understanding of what was going on. Okay, I'm feeling a little pedantic here, so I think I'm gonna move on to the next section. A quick timeline. Um, so this is, I mean, this is the merest sketch. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you why these, these three are important. So in 1610, Galileo becomes world famous, basically. I mean, at least European famous. Um, he writes the Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger, which is an account of his early telescopic discoveries. Um, he didn't exactly invent the telescope, but he developed it quickly into an actually astronomically useful instrument. Um, so he improved it rapidly. 
and he was one of the first to take serious and detailed uh, telescopic observations of the things we can see in the sky. Um, so he rushes this into print because he knows other people are going to be able to do this soon. Uh, and it contains these bombshell discoveries like Jupiter has moons. And he establishes that by careful, painstaking observation of these four little stars that show up in a line on either side of Jupiter and they stay with it. Um, there's the lunar surface. The moon's surface looks like a landscape, not like a perfect glassy orb. Um, uh, the Milky Way is a bunch of stars rather than some kind of milky looking, milky sort of substance or fluid or, or whatever, whatever other theory might have, might have been uh, to account for its naked eye appearance. Um, and a few other things too. So the, the big one though is the, the lunar surface and, the, and the, what he called the Medician stars, the, the moons of Jupiter. He named after the Medici family in Florence and he made this work into basically a job application to try to get a cushier job in the court of Florence. And he was successful. Um, so Galileo becomes famous at that point and famous for his telescopic discoveries, famous for his mathematical work, and, um, and becomes pretty soon thereafter known as probably a Copernican. He probably thinks the sun is in the middle. Um, for people who pay attention to those things, it becomes pretty clear that's what he thinks, even though he hasn't come out in print yet and said, yes, I believe that. Um, He's starting to get that reputation. So not too long thereafter, in about 1614, um, maybe starting the year previous, uh, he starts to get preached against um, for that reason. Um, there, are, there are preachers saying, uh, I have to say some of these are Dominicans actually, not necessarily the order's finest moment, but um, they start preaching against, against the Copernicans and against Galileo particularly because they say this is against scripture. Scripture clearly says the earth is still, God established it and it does not move. And in various places, it's quite clear in scripture that the sun is described as moving. Um, you have, I might as well run through a couple of them right now. Uh, you have the miracle of the sun in Joshua. Why is it a miracle that the sun stopped and held still while the Israelites defeated their enemies? Well, it's a miracle because the sun normally moves. So the implication is the sun moves. Um, you have Psalm 19 that I think says the sun comes out like a bridegroom to run its course or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's a, sort of a hymn to the glory of creation and the sun in, in the creation, but it's, it's clearly described as moving. Um, you have as well uh, Ecclesiastes, and I think there's a pas passage in Job too. Um, so, but those were some of the, the frequently mentioned ones. So at least on the surface, it looks like scripture says the earth holds still and the sun moves. Well, Copernicus and now apparently Galileo want to say the opposite. The sun is in the middle, it holds still, and the earth moves. Well, how can you go against scripture? So he's getting preached against, and uh, perhaps more disturbing to him is that his patron or the, the mother of his patron, so the Grand Duchess of Tuscany, the mother of the person ruling the Tuscan city-state at that time, um, had a conversation with some professors at her table in which she was considering the question, is this compatible with scripture? And um, she seemed to be somewhat inclined to think no. So Galileo realizes he has to defend himself here. He can't just ignore this. It's not just a few random preachers, but it's getting to his patrons and getting up to higher level people, you know, more authoritative people. Um, so he needs to defend his reputation and his, his bona fides as a, uh, as a faithful Catholic, as somebody who's not teaching against scripture, who's not heretical, et cetera. So he writes some letters, which we'll get to, and writing a letter in that time and then distributing copies of it was a way to disseminate something you wanted to write without actually publishing it and having, having to get it approved past the censor, et cetera. So there's these sort of semi-public documents that start getting sent out. Um, famously, the letter to Castelli, which I'll talk about later on, and then a, a, a expanded version that he calls the letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, in which he lays out his position on how should we proceed, what's, re what's the reasonable way to proceed, and how should the church proceed when something is being investigated by um, natural scientists, basically, um, and it looks like it's against the meaning of certain scriptural passages.
So we will, I will talk about those in more detail, but that's more or less what's going on at this, at this part. So the big picture for, for this slide, if you will, is, is here we have part one of the Galileo affair. And the culmination of that part is that Copernicanism is determined by the Holy Office, by the Inquisition, to be erroneous and contrary to scripture um, for philosophical and theological reasons is deemed to be erroneous. And it, the, the book of Copernicus and certain other writings that are explicitly heliocentric are put on the index of prohibited books. Galileo is warned at the culmination of that. He's privately warned that he's not to teach or hold or defend this view. Um, and this is what sets up the, the final, the sort of Galileo affair part two, which is here, which is much later. And we have a different Pope at this point. Galileo thinks that he's okay. He thinks the winds have shifted a little bit. He's okay to publish a work that's more or less openly heliocentric, but it's written as a dialogue. So None, none of it is explicitly in the words of the author. It's in, it's in the mouth of characters who are having a dialogue. He thinks that's probably enough to be okay to publish this work. He publishes it and he gets in big trouble because the church, the, the Pope and the Holy Office and various cardinals look at it and say, this is exactly what you were told not to do. Um, and this is when Galileo famously has to say, I recant what I said. I abjure the things that I've said. Um, and his book is prohibited. Um, and then he's put under house arrest in uh, his villa outside of Florence. You might think villa outside of Florence, not so bad, right? I mean, there's a lot of things worse than that. Um, on the other hand, in this, this quarantine-ish environment, we might have sympathy with anybody who's put under house arrest right now. Okay, I'm gonna talk mostly about this first affair because that's really where the substantive questions of, is this compatible with scripture? And how do these, things, how do these different inquiries you know, understanding scripture and the church's authoritative teaching about it, how does that relate to inquiring into nature and trying to understand it by the tools of natural philosophy and mathematics and science? Um, that's when the substantive things were really worked out. The second part is more about the legal question of did Galileo violate the injunction that was put upon him in, in part one? Um, so I'm gonna talk mostly about part one because that's where the actual scripture and science was uh, that question about the relationship between scripture and scientific inquiry was most centrally on the table. Now, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this bit over here about heliocentrism um, and come back to that. If, if people have questions that have to do with the astronomy and the theory, uh, the theory and the observations uh, that Galileo took to be supportive of heliocentrism over geocentrism, we could come to that back to that in, in the Q&A. But I'm gonna jump right into the meat and potatoes here. So the big, um, the big piece of the context here is that this is counter-reformation Catholicism. Um, so we are still only a number of decades uh, removed from the Council of Trent where the church sort of gets itself reorganized to meet the, uh, the uh, challenge of the Protestant Reformation. Um, and, the, and the teachings that were being um, proffered by the, by the big figures in the, in the Reformation. So the piece of the Council of Trent that's relevant here, I'm gonna put this up and get myself out of the way. I'm gonna read this out. It's, it's very important for this whole affair. So this is in 1546. The council says, furthermore, in order to restrain petulant spirits, it decrees, and it is the council, um, it decrees that no one relying on his own skill shall in matters of faith and of morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, resting the sacred scripture to his own senses, presume to interpret the said sacred scripture contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, whose it is to judge of the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, hath held and doth hold. That's a long sentence, and we're not even through with it yet. Um, okay, pause or even contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers, the church fathers, even though such interpretations were never intended to be at any time published. Okay. What is that saying? Well, two things to notice. I'll go back to the text in a second. Two things to notice. It's basically about uh, prohibiting an individual Catholic from an individual Christian from saying, 
hey, I think this passage of scripture means something different from the church teaches or something different from what the church fathers unanimously thought. Um, and I just, you know, in my heart and praying and discerning and inspired by the Holy Spirit, think it means something different from that. So it's prohibiting that. You can see this is quite clearly responding to the Protestant Reformation. Um, but notice the qualifications involved. First, in matters of faith and of morals. So it looks like we're talking about not just any bit of scripture, but something that pertains to matters of faith and of morals. At least that's what it looks like on the surface. This becomes part of the controversy. Notice it's also not just about things that are explicitly defined by the teacher's official magisterium, but anything that was unanimously held about the interpretation of scripture or of some piece of scripture by the church fathers was taken to be part of the controlling authority here as well. So why is this important? Well, none of the church fathers were heliocentrists. <laughs> so when they look at Psalm 19, or when they looked at the miracle of the sun, and they said, what's going on here? Let's interpret this scripture. And they wrote about it. They always wrote about it as if it means just what it says, that the earth is holding still and the sun is moving, except when a miracle happens and the sun stops moving. Um, so this is the, the way that heliocentrism becomes seen as actually a teaching of the church, sorry, as potentially against the teaching of the church because of the consensus of the fathers. Okay. Now, Galileo has something to say about that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Another big thing to notice there is just that the issue at the time was not so much about the interpretation of scripture, whether you had to be literal all the time or could sometimes be figurative, et cetera. It was really about the reinterpretation of scripture. So once the church had said, this is how the church reads this passage, right? Um, the church has the authority and the competence to say that, and this is what the church says. Um, once that's been said, an individual can't come along and say, actually it means something totally different. So that this is the this is kind of the question of authority and individual interpretation, um, and it's because all the church fathers it didn't occur to them to think other than geocentrically, I guess you could say. Um, that's why this becomes uh, a sticking point, in particular. So one one mis misconception that I want you not to have is that the church at the time, or the or theologians at the time, or scriptural interpreters within the church at the time were extremely literal all over the place and they, and they didn't think that scripture had lots of senses and could be interpreted figuratively. Um, they certainly did, they certainly did. Um, and if you look at some of the church fathers, Galileo in fact cites some of the church fathers, especially uh, St. Augustine. Um, St. Augustine's work on the literal interpretation of Genesis, you should read that sometime, you'll be, you'll be astonished at what he considers a literal interpretation. Um, so the church was not slavishly literal. That's not the point. Um, the point was that there was a question of authority of who gets to interpret what is the true sense of scripture um, and a question of reinterpretation. Um, and so the tradition, the authority of the church tradition um, is codified here in the Council of Trent. And that's why that consensus of the fathers is so important. Okay, so Galileo responds. Let's go to some of his points in his responses. 1613, he writes a letter, you know, it's nominally to his friend, Benedetto Castelli, who's a priest who was at the Grand Duchess's table when they were having this controversial discussion. And that's when Galileo heard about that and said, okay, I need to defend myself. Um, so he writes a letter as if it's just to Castelli, but then copies are distributed to sort of get his position out there to clear his name and clarify his position and hopefully influence uh, pe people in the church or people influential in the church. Um, to leave this question open and not condemn Copernicanism as heretical um, before he has the chance to make the arguments for it. Okay, so what does he say here? Here are some of the key points. I really recommend everybody just read this letter. It's short, it's pithy, Galileo's a great writer. Um, but here are some of the key points. So the issue was when some, some claim about the natural world was not yet demonstrated to be true, or it wasn't recognized to be demonstrated to be certainly true, but, but was potentially demonstrable, right? So why does that matter? Let me back up a little bit. 
This is one of the things Galileo says here, and this was held by everybody involved in the affair. This was common ground, unanimous. It being obvious that two truths can never contradict each other, the task of wise interpreters is to strive to find the true meanings of scriptural passages agreeing with those physical conclusions of which we are already certain and sure from clear sensory experience or from necessary demonstrations. Okay, again, long sentences, but just take a second, digest it. Two truths can never contradict each other. So if something is really demonstrated to be true about nature, from one of the sciences, it can't contradict scripture. So if it looks like it's contradicting scripture and it's really demonstrated, then we need to look more closely to find out what the true meaning of that scriptural passage is, right? We don't reject the demonstrated claim. We say that's part of truth and truth is one. And so if, if a passage in scripture looks like it contradicts that, then we go back and look more closely until we find out what it really means. So nobody in this, in this dispute thought that, oh, a science has established something, but who cares about science? We're all about faith. That wasn't, that wasn't anybody's position in the church at this time. So the, the sticking point, however, is when something isn't yet demonstrated, but it might be demonstrable. You might have a demonstration. There's not agreement about that yet, or you might have it, you don't have it yet, but maybe we'll get a demonstration if we keep studying it, keep trying to understand it, keep doing more observations, more theorizing. Um, what do you do then? If you have a, a thesis that isn't yet demonstrated, but might be demonstrable, and it looks like it contradicts some scriptural passages about nature, what do you do? Well, Galileo wants to, to propose a way to go. So another thing he points out, sorry, zooming back in, is that scripture speaks in several senses. It can be literal or figurative and those that they're subspecies of those um, a whole taxonomy of different senses of, of scriptural passages was established by this point in in christian theology scripture is accommodated to the understanding of people because so that it can be you know if efficacious for our salvation um, it's not there to teach us about astronomy it's accommodated to our understanding and our way of thinking so galileo's point here is that when it says something about nature, it's not necessarily making a, uh, what we would call today a scientific claim. It's speaking about it in a way that's adapted to our understanding and conduces towards our salvation. Um, so in that case, when you have uh, a passage about nature and you don't know what the true interpretation is, what determines the true interpretation? What sense is the true interpretation? Well, so he goes through in this letter a few different options um, to answer that question. Some would say, well, theology answers it. Theology is queen of the sciences. Um, so he says, well, yes and no. Theology is queen of the sciences because of the subject matter, because it considers the most noble and spiritual and lofty and most important and eternal subject matter, not because it's the queen in the sense that it can dictate conclusions to the other sciences. Another candidate is, well, if we don't know what the true sense is, well, let's go back and see if there's a consensus of the church fathers. And, he, and that was, of course, relevant because of that passage in the, in the Council of Trent that I was mentioning a second ago. Well, he says, Galileo says, the fathers didn't have any reason to question geocentrism. They did, didn't take up the issue at all. So for them, it wasn't, their consensus shouldn't be interpreted as a teaching, like the fathers all considered this and then agreed on it. It was just, this was the background view of their day and they didn't think it was very relevant to consider. So of course they were geocentrists. Final key point that I wanna, I wanna pick out here is, and this I think is, is one of Galileo's best points, is a principle of prudence. And he draws this maybe from his own brain, but also from St. Augustine. Um, if something isn't yet demonstrated, but it could be demonstrated at some future time, then it shouldn't be rashly condemned as contrary to scripture. Because what that, all that does, and St. Augustine says this quite explicitly, is what you've done in that case is you've said, Scripture teaches this, and then later on, somebody proves that that's not true. And then you've damaged the credibility of Scripture. If somebody's convinced by your, your position on the interpretation of Scripture, and then they see that demonstration come down, come down the road later on, um, then they say, well, okay, Scripture's just been proved to be wrong. When, according to St. Augustine, 
and the church and Galileo, what's actually happened is you were wrong about your interpretation initially. So it's important, he says, not to you know, prematurely condemn a view about nature as anti-scriptural if it could be demonstrated to be true later on. So we should be careful. The church should be careful. We as Christians, as Catholics, should be careful. That's one of the, that's sort of the, this principle of prudence that he brings up um, and draws uh, authority for it from St. Augustine. Okay, I'm going to pull out just a couple more passages here. Thus, given that in many places scripture is not only capable, but necessarily in need of interpretations different from the apparent meaning of the words, it seems to me that in disputes about natural phenomena, it should be reserved to the last place. Meaning, if the question is, does the sun go around the earth, or does the earth go around the sun? Um, scriptural evidence, according to Galileo, should be sort of your last line of evidence for establishing that question. Um, because scripture is not really about that in its purpose. And when it does talk about that, it speaks in a way accommodated to our understanding and scripture has many senses. So when we have a dispute like this, scriptural evidence might be part of the picture, but it should be sort of in the last, the last uh, sort of lowest category of evidence for this kind of question. Notice that is, there's something reasonable about that. It's also kind of a controversial thing for him to say at that point. Um, if theology is the queen of the sciences, and he's saying, actually on this kind of question, it's at the lowest level of the ladder. Um, there's a sort of reordering of the authority of different disciplines here. Um, Galileo tries to be somewhat diplomatic about this most of the time. But there is something, something in, in some sense radical about this claim, at least potentially, and actually at the time, controversial. <clears throat> this is that, that principle of prudence again. I should believe that it would be prudent not to allow anyone to oblige scriptural passages to have to maintain the truth of any physical conclusions whose contrary could ever be shown to us by the senses and demonstrative and necessary reasons. Meaning, if something could be proved later on, then you shouldn't condemn it as anti-scriptural. Um, that will end up just undermining the credibility of scripture and the church in the long run. Okay, in 1615, he gives an expanded version of this, and I'm not going to go through all the details of this. Um, this one is really worth reading. He, he comments on passages from theologians and from the Church Fathers, particularly Augustine. Um, and it's also sort of very clever and complicated in how he makes some concessions to the priority of Scripture as a sort of superior source of knowledge than our own reason. But at the same time, wants to say, nonetheless, in this kind of a question, you should let the argument go on among the scientists and not condemn it before the arguments have been made on both sides. Um, so for interest of time, I'm not going to go further into this, this letter, ex except to say that and to recommend that you read it, because it's, it's, it really is uh, part of our heritage as Catholics, is this is a really interesting and important reflection on on the interpretation of scripture and its relationship to scientific inquiry. And um, Galileo's ideas in this, in this letter are, are much praised by uh, Pope John Paul II in his address in 1992. So if you need a recommendation, it's got a good recommendation. Okay, I'm gonna skip past those and jump back out. Okay, the big response to Galileo's letters or his initial letter anyway, was a letter that Cardinal Bellarmine wrote. St. Robert Bellarmine was the head of the Holy Office at the time, was the most important and authoritative theologian in the church at the time. Um, and this is a really famous passage, so I feel like I can't leave this one out even if I'm, even if I'm a little behind my schedule right now. <clears throat> so this is the, called the letter to Foscarini. Um, who was Foscarini, he was a, a priest who just out of nowhere in the middle of this when Galileo is trying to dance around the issue and be sort of diplomatic and not get in trouble and make space for this question to be, be okay or given uh, room to be disputed by the church authorities. This, this work is published um, explicitly saying Copernicanism, Copernicanism is not only okay, it actually fits really well with scripture. And a priest comes out and publishes this 
um, in the middle of these delicate negotiations, uh, it's sort of like a bombshell being dropped into a negotiation system, a negotiation situation. This is the famous, the most famous sentence from this letter. Um, so I'm gonna read it for you. I say that if there were a true demonstration that the sun is at the center of the world and the earth in the third heaven, and that the sun does not circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun, then one would have to proceed with great care in explaining the scriptures that appear contrary and say rather that we do not understand them than that what is demonstrated is false. But I will not believe that there is such a demonstration until it is shown me. Now notice the if then structure of this, of this first sentence, if there were a too, true demonstration of the Copernican view of the heliocentric view, then one would have to proceed with great care in explaining the scriptures that appear contrary and say rather that we do not understand them rather than saying that the heliocentrism is false. But I will not believe that there is such a demonstration until it is shown me. So at one level, this seems extremely reasonable. Um, I'll accept, I would accept this view if there's a demonstration um, but until there's a demonstration, until there's proof, I'm not going to believe it. Um, that seems very rational. But the question is, as, does this sentence really represent the, the understanding of the church as it actually acted in this case? And look more closely at the if part of the sentence here. You could say this meaning if there were a true demonstration, and then sort of aside in a parenthesis, and there isn't, and there can't be. <laughs> Right? So it could be sort of a counterfactual hypothesis, like if, you know, when pigs fly, there were a true, true demonstration of this, then here's how we would proceed. But I'm not going to believe that there is such a thing until there's, until there's a demonstration, until I see a demonstration, and I'm not holding my breath. Right? So you could take it that way, or you could take it as, no, Cardinal Bellarmine really thinks there might have been a demonstration forthcoming later on, and he's just saying we're not there yet. The difficulty with using this passage to completely exonerate the church's wisdom in this whole affair, I think, is that the church didn't say, well, you don't have it yet, Galileo, go back to the drawing board and work on it some more. They basically said, we don't want you working on this anymore. Um, so, so taking this sentence as sort of the, the key to understanding everything has some pitfalls there because this is, the view of Cardinal Bellarmine, but how did he understand how to put this into action? And how did the church actually put this understanding into action? It's a little more complicated. Okay. Oh, I had a zoom in feature there. Okay. This one's also important. So though I'm pushing time, I'm going to do it anyway. Sorry, Brother John. Nor can one answer that this is not a matter of faith, right? So if somebody says, hey, look at the Council of Trent. It said that you can't reinterpret the scriptures against the consensus of the fathers in matters of faith and morals. Well, astronomy is not a matter of faith and morals, so I should be good to go here, right? So you can imagine Galileo saying that, and he more or less did say that. Um, but Cardinal Bellarmine says this in response to this kind of view. Nor can one answer that this is not a matter of faith, since if it is not a matter of faith as regards the topic, it is a matter of faith as regards the speaker. And so it would be heretical to say that Abraham did not have two children in Jacob 12, as well as to say that Christ was not born of a virgin because both are said by the Holy Spirit. So he thinks in that passage from the Council of Trent, it's not just about passages of scripture that are explicitly dealing with matters of faith in terms of like something that's in the creed or something like that. But he, he takes matter of faith to include faith in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of all the scriptures. So that applies to all the scriptures, right? Um, so even when scripture is talking about the sun, he thinks uh, this, this qualifies as a matter of faith according to that passage in the Council of Trent. So he thinks that, uh, that judgment from the Council of Trent does apply to this question in his view because it's a matter of faith as regards the speaker. It's a matter of faith in the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of scripture. Okay. Now, I'll just point out that that's sort of a checkmate for Galileo's position right there. Um, if, the, if this is ruled out by the Council of Trent and the most powerful cardinal of the day says, actually, yes, that passage from the Council of Trent does apply to this question, then however good Galileo's arguments are in other respects, 
he's sort of doomed to lose. Um, and lo, it came to pass. He loses. Um, in 1616, after Copernicanism was judged erroneous by the Holy Office, and Copernicus's book was put on the index of prohibited books, St. Saint Robert Bellarmin was instructed by the Pope to deliver this result to, Gal result to Galileo in person. Now, I don't have time to go into this either, but the phrasing of exactly what Galileo was told not to do became controversial. There were two documents, slightly different phrasings. Galileo thought that the phrasing of one of them made it okay for him to publish his famous dialogue on the two chief world systems you know, many years later, um, when the church thought, no, look at this other document, that's the real document, um, here's what it says, and it's very clear, you can't do anything of the kind. Um, so that's part of the setup and part of the sort of legal complexity of this case. All right, I'm gonna wrap up and go to questions here, and I'm throwing a lot of things at the wall here, so bear with me and, and uh, please write your questions down or type them into the chat as they occur to you. Let's run through some myths, red herrings, overreactions and oversimplifications and dismiss them um, to close. And then, and then we'll look at this little wisdom ball over here in the bottom right. Um, that's where we want to go. So uh, part of the, the mythology here is that Galileo was tortured by the Inquisition and thrown into prison. That's just actually false. Never happened. So somebody says that and you say, that's false. Never happened. It's a myth. Um, there's a view uh, according to which Galileo got in trouble with the church, not because of anything he did scientifically or anything he wrote about astronomy, but because he jumped onto theological ground where he didn't belong and then he did a bunch of bad theology and that's how he got in trouble. Um, there's a couple of ways in which that's wrong, I think, even though it, it, there's a grain of truth in it in that he did get in trouble when he ventured onto theological territory. Um, but, uh, for one thing, he was reluctant to do so and only did so when uh, he was being publicly condemned from the pulpit in his city and, um, and people were telling his patrons and political rulers that he was a heretic. Um, so I think that's about time to defend yourself. Um, the other thing is that his theology is actually pretty good. <laughs> um, and John Paul II is with me on this. Um, he's it's, it's quite insightful and quite, quite balanced, his consideration of of how to apply the traditional teaching of the senses of scripture um, and certain patristic passages to, to a question like this. Um, so it's actually quite a contribution to the church's understanding, I think, what Galileo wrote on this question. Um, another view is that, the ch uh, another myth is that, well, the church, you know, it was proved to be true. Galileo had proof, the church rejected it. Um, and that's something that goes along with this is that, you know, the cardinals wouldn't look through the telescope because they thought it would show them the devil or something like that. These are all myths. They were made up in the, in the Enlightenment period by Voltaire wannabes and so on. Um, the, if something were, was proved and demonstrated to be true, it was, it was consensus in church theology and teaching at the time that that could not contradict scripture. Then. And if it looks like it does, then you go back and see how you were, re how you were interpreting the scripture incorrectly. Um, so the church wasn't against proven science and just sort of beating it down with, with the sword of authority. Um, another view that sort of seeks to wash the church's hands here is that the church just wanted to see proof and Galileo didn't have proof. So that often goes with that passage from Cardinal Bellarmine. That, that's the favorite passage of those who want to want to read the, the whole event this way. Um, I'm not sure that exactly works for the reason I pointed out. Um, the church left the Copernican books on the index of prohibited books for a long time, um, quite a long time, um, counting in centuries, not decades. So uh, there, there was a lot of evidence being piled up in the intervening um, decades and centuries. And so I think you gotta say there, there's something dysfunctional at some level about the way the church ended up handling this. Um, I don't think there's any way around that. Um, if it was just, well, you don't have proof yet, Galileo, but come back to us when you do, then he wouldn't have been abjured never to teach anything about it. It would have said, well, we're not going to accept this yet as, as sort of a legit, as, as for sure, but we'll let you discuss it and see if you can come up with a demonstration. That's not, in fact, what the church authorities did. Um, so I don't think that works as a, as a sort of exoneration or, or um, ap apology for the, for the church's actions at the time. Um, Another version of this 
another variation of this is that, well, if you look at Galileo's writings, he says that any theory that isn't totally proved should be rejected if it looks like it contradicts scripture. Um, well, and he was overconfident. He didn't have a, a complete proof. And that's, that's actually true. He didn't have a certain demonstration of heliocentrism. It was an open question scientifically. And we can go back to that if there's time in the Q&A. Um, but it was, it was an open question. He had some good arguments, but there were some good questions about heliocentrism to which he didn't have answers yet. Um, so saying that Galileo sort of by his own standards should have been rejected, um, should have been told that this was not permissible. Um, that's sort of cherry picking a couple passages for one thing. Um, Galileo argues like a lawyer who is writing to a whole sort of Supreme Court of justices, right? He, he has one argument that's gonna work with the Scalia. He has one argument that's gonna work with the Ginsburg. He has one. And in his own mind, he has a coherent view, but he's not trying to give a, a treatise in these writings. He's trying to argue, he's trying to advocate for a certain decision on a particular case. Um, so it's, you have to read it more like a legal brief than a philosophical treatise. So this last bit is often uh, Catholic philosophers reading Galileo's text and say, aha, we found a contradiction, checkmate. Um, and I think that's actually just kind of a mistake about the genre of writing that it is and um, usually betrays a lack of attention to the full range of what he wrote on the question. Anyway, that's enough about that. I have my own wheelhouse about that. I have a whole paper about that. You can tell I'm talking about it too long. So let's go to the wisdom bit. Wisdom sounds good. Let's get some of that. Um, it's considered to be part of the, the office of wisdom or the wise to order, to put things in order and in proper relationship and hierarchy to each other. Um, I think it's absolutely the case. The Galileo affair doesn't show a fundamental conflict between Christian faith and science. And if you want to see really good arguments to that effect, read Galileo, because he thought there wasn't a fundamental conflict here and uh, a proper understanding of how we should think about scripture and the investigation of nature allows for a harmonious, uh, harmonious uh, living together of the authoritative church and uh, the inquiring scientist. But it does raise an important challenge for Christian wisdom. How can the church, as the custodian of a definitive revelation, something that's revealed definitively, where we know this is true, it's not something, you know, the Nicene Creed isn't something that, you know, we, we check up on every so often and say like, well, what's the evidence this year looking like for, for the Nicene Creed? And like, no, that's the, that's the revelation of God through Christ. Um, and the church has the custody of that revelation and the authority to teach it um, and to, and to help, help articulate and define it. Um, so how can the church in that you know, incredible office, how can it properly relate to the kinds of inquiry into nature or into history, by the way, um, into nature and history that are ongoing and developmental and sometimes revolutionary, sometimes undergo sort of radical change as new evidence or new ways of thinking come up. How can the church be properly open to that without emptying out the faith of its content? Um, I don't think there's any magic bullet here. It's, it's a question of, I, th I think wisdom is the right way to think about it. The church needs to be infused by the Holy Spirit with that gift of wisdom to discern as as the sciences and the, and the disciplines studying the natural world and the, and the history of that world, as they do their work, the church needs to be attending, conversing, listening, and finally judging and ordering, um, but doing so in a way uh, that is patient, deliberate, uh, and open-minded, but also holding on to the deposit of faith. Um, so yeah, but that's hard. We shouldn't expect that to be an easy task for the church as it moves through through the ages. Um, but the Galileo affair shows us, I think, an avoidable tragic sort of conflict. Um, it's not tragic in the sense of a Greek tragedy where this is fate and it's inexorable and nothing that these individuals or institutions um, could have done would have averted this. In fact, when they try to avert it, it gets worse, right? It's not tragic in that sense. It's tragic in the sense that the resources for a more harmonious resolution were there. Um, and so uh, in trying to understand this, I hope, I hope this has been somewhat helpful. I think I will close now and open up for questions and hopefully we will find some wisdom together. So. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Zepeda, for your uh, 
your insightful presentation on this whole Galileo imbroglio with the church and the conflict. But we have time for just a couple questions. The first question we have is from Yvette Richardson, who is a parishioner here at St. Dominic's Church. So I'll allow her to ask her question. I want to know how um, Galileo had used his free will, because when you think about it, your free will is it, the way that you're, the, how you describe it could be different than another person's, in other words. And so I think that's how the church had a conflict with Galileo. And would that be something that would be the cause of it, in other words? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and a tough one. I'll compliment you on your question. Um, I think Galileo does does sort of see it that way in the following way. I think he thinks... I don't think he, in his writings, he says like, um, you know, well, I'm an individual with my own free will and nobody can tell me what to believe. He doesn't say that generally speaking as a universal proposition. I think he he accepts, or at least when he writes for the public, he accepts um, what he thought in his own heart, I'm not sure. But when he writes, he accepts that the church has the the authority to define what the Christian should believe about about the faith. Um, he wants to say, in a demonstrative science like, uh, like mathematics, or he would say astronomy as well, um, in that domain, uh, just because a legitimate religious superior or authority tells me I should believe something, it can't actually revise what's demonstrated in that domain. So there is a kind of proper autonomy, he thinks, of that sort of science. And so what he wants to, to do uh, in part is make a distinction between where the church has kind of command authority and where something is um, not exact, not outside the scope of the church entirely, but, but has to be dealt with in a different way because it has its own integrity as a, as a source of certainty. So he talks about the book of nature, which comes from God, in the book of scripture, which, and he says, they both come from God. We study them and learn about them in different ways. And so in his view, the church's uh, authority over an individual's free will and freedom of belief um, is different in those two domains when it comes to the book of nature and the book of, mm. book of scripture as it addresses our salvation and, and matters of faith. So he really wants to say in the council of Trent, matters of faith, that means matters of faith, not just anything in scripture. It means something rather specific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, it's running a little bit long, but I would like to conclude with just one question. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask everybody who's here if you would be willing to turn on your video so that we can take a screenshot of everybody in our parish who's here for this talk. That would be great. Um, and then at the end of my my question and Dr. Zapata's answer, we can take a quick screenshot before we conclude. Um, so here's, here's my question. I had in the back of my mind a situation where, for example, I go into Starbucks and I'm standing in line and it comes up that I'm Catholic and somebody says, wait, why are you Catholic? Didn't you hear about what the church did to Galileo? The science and faith are incompatible. How can you not believe in science today? What would be, the thing you would say to reply to somebody just in a moment like that? It's just quick and efficient answer to somebody. I guess the, the most, the quickest would be, well, Galileo didn't think so. <laughs> um, the next quickest would be, Galileo didn't think so, and you should read his letter to the Grand Duchess Christina. It's awesome. It's all about how science and scripture work together really well. It's great. I love Galileo. I love science. Thanks for bringing him up. <laughs> I would say. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. It's so great when you can respond to an objection someone has against the church by telling them, wait, go read the objector a little bit more carefully because what you're saying is not what they actually thought. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Zapeta. And uh, everybody ready for your screenshot? <laughs> Smile, wave. Okay, wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. God bless. And I look forward to seeing everybody again whenever next time happens to be.
Bye.